Hello, I'm Karen Ginoni. This is Outside Source. And every day, Outside Source features BBC journalists working in over 30 languages. Your questions are always welcome. BBC OS is the hashtag. Well, the United States is reeling from its third deadliest school shooting in modern history. This is 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz. He's been identified as the gunman and charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder. It happened in the Parkland, Florida, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the school that Nicholas Cruz used to attend. It is the 18th school shooting in America this year alone, and each time, question of how this could happen is asked. Here's Florida's governor, Rick Scott. So what do we know of the gunman? Well, a lot comes from Nicholas Cruz's own social media posts. This is his Instagram. There are dozens of photos of weapons and him posing with guns and knives, wearing a balaclava. We know he was expelled from the school for disciplinary reasons. The maths teacher, Jim Gard, says, we were told last year that he wasn't allowed on campus with a backpack on. But still, he wasn't high on the police's radar. Here's the county sheriff. Well, during Wednesday's Outside Source, this time yesterday, the shooting was still active. We brought you that story, but at that stage, only from the helicopter aerials. Uh, now we have a lot more detail. Many of the students had mobile phones. They recorded and uploaded what they were experiencing. A warning, some of it is disturbing. Firstly, this is a student's video of the terrifying moment that shots rang out. Well, the shooting began near the end of the school day. Uh, the gunman set off a fire alarm so that students would have... Well, people barricaded themselves inside classrooms. They hid in cupboards. Some had to wait for more than an hour. And this is the moment that officers arrived in one classroom and pupils realized they were finally safe. Well, here's what uh, some of the students who escaped then had to say. We're also hearing incredible stories of bravery as well. This is the football coach, Aaron Feiss, and he was killed trying to shield some of his students. And the first of the student victims has been named. This is Jamie Gutenberg. Her family has confirmed her death on Facebook. Sadly, these types of attacks are frequent. They are the worst shootings in the country since 1999. The Florida attack is the deadliest at a U.S. high school, and that surpasses, you can see there, Columbine, Colorado, in 1999, that massacre. Now, while this shooting was going on, Senator Chris Murphy, whose district includes Handy Hook Elementary School, stood up in the Senate and said this. So what's been the political fallout so far? Well, a little earlier, President Trump addressed the nation. So strong on emotion, but no mention of gun control ahead of the shooting this was posted by the gunman. This uh, we said to uh, show an AR-15. It's a semi-automatic rifle, and it's very likely to be the weapon he used. Now, in this article in the LA Times, it reveals that the latest and the deadliest mass shootings in America all involve that particular weapon. Now, firearm rights are such a divisive topic in America. Here's Sheriff Israel again. Well, Neda Taufik is at the school. She gave us this update. The people that I've spoken with uh, are still feeling pretty raw emotionally about this. Um, some adults still crying in tears when they speak about this and are comforted by those in the community who approach them and ask how they're doing. Uh, students I spoke with say they're still in shock over what happened here. They never expected something like this in their community. It's something that they've seen, of course, numerous times on their television screens in other parts of the nation. Uh, so again, really raw emotion still. But also, we've been hearing from uh, those who have been victims here that they do want some some kind of action on something, anything to reduce these types of shootings. A teacher who helped shield 19 kids in the closet of her classroom saying that the nation failed them and failed to keep them safe. And these are the types of stories we're hearing again and again from people here in the community. Neda, where is the investigation heading and what do we know about how much was known about the threat that this individual might have posed? Well, authorities here, and specifically the Broward County Sheriff, says they're going to be doing an exhaustive investigation, speaking to students, uh, as many as they can, to get a clearer picture of what they knew about the shooter. But he was on the FBI's radar as early as November, we have learned. Uh, at that point, a YouTube blogger flagged him up to the agency because he posted a message that said, I am going to be a professional school shooter. Now, the FBI has come back and said that uh, they did hold an investigation 
investigation. They were unable to identify who that person was. And now they've promised to again look into their failings in that investigation. Um, we do know uh, he was in court recently charged uh, uh, in front of a judge with those 17 counts of premeditated murder. He's being held now without bail. And as I say, authorities trying to piece together uh, what other groups he was involved with. There was a white supremacist group he was involved with here in Florida. Um, and, and what other uh, messages he posted on social media that can give a clue into his motive. Neda, briefly, every time a tragedy like this happens, we ask the same questions about guns in America. Do we really expect anything to change? You know, I keep saying that our country is more divided than ever on this issue. You have a president who is an ally of the NRA, a very powerful gun lobby organization. And what we've heard from lawmakers today doesn't um, really shed uh, any comfort to those who do want to see some consensus on this issue. Neda Talfik in Florida will be hearing from the pro-gun side of the debate in around 20 minutes' time. Now, South Africa has a new leader. Cyril Ramaphosa was officially sworn in as president just 16 hours after his predecessor, Jacob Zuma, was forced to step down. This is what happened a little bit earlier in Parliament today. Well, as you saw there, the chamber erupting into cheering. But uh, take a look at what happens next. Uh, more scenes of jubilation and even singing. Well, Cyril Ramaphosa began his term by declaring a new era for South Africa, a promise to fight corruption and a pledge to serve the people. Let's hear from him. Well, Ramaphosa's elevation caps a week of suspense and drama. We simply didn't know if and when Jacob Zuma was going to resign. We finally showed you this last night. Jacob Zuma officially resigning. He was effectively pushed from the top job by his own party, the ANC. What is ahead for South Africa's new leader? Cyril Ramaphosa's job will not be easy. The economy is faltering. Unemployment sits at nearly 27% and corruption is rife. More now from Milton Nkosi. Here, a former youth football coach has been found guilty of the remaining sexual assault charges against him. In total, Barry Burnell was convicted of 43 offences against 11 boys between 1979 and 1990. One of his victims spoke outside court. I'm Karen Ginoni. This is Outside Source, live from the BBC Newsroom. Our top story... Well, South Africa's new president has a big job ahead of him, we were saying. At the top of Cyril Ramaphosa's agenda will be reviving the nation's struggling economy. The latest figures show economic growth of just 2%. Political turmoil and poor public finances have been big problems. So, too, is the staggeringly high unemployment rate, nearly 27%. And that's one reason the country desperately needs more investment. South Africa's been struggling to attract that from abroad. In 2016 direct foreign investment was $2.27 billion. That was significantly down on previous years. One economist we spoke to said uh, South Africa's economy is almost at rock bottom and a big change in policy is needed. Now, President Trump's budget plans for 2019 faced scrutiny earlier as his Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin was grilled by an influential congressional committee in Washington. In focus, uh, plan, reports of a plan to increase the federal gasoline tax by 25 cents to help fund the president's $1.5 trillion infrastructure plan. Uh, let's go over to Joe Miller, who's in New York. How controversial is this, Joe? Let's bring you a couple of stories from the Winter Olympics. We've talked a lot about the Russian athletes competing under the banner of the neutral Olympic athletes from Russia name. Well, the hockey team isn't taking any chances. Ilya Kovalchuk won't even allow the Russian flag to be shown in selfies with fans. While fans can be as patriotic as they want, all the athletes signed a document saying they won't protest the ruling that team, turned Team Russia into the OAR. Kovalchak says, uh, we uh, won't chase fans away if they're carrying Russian flags. We'll talk to them, explain it, and take a photo without the flag. Now, for the athletes, it is a long road to the Winter Olympics, but what about their parents? For one Swiss couple who wanted to see their son compete, they travelled to the Games almost all the way by bicycle. Katie Silver has their story.
is parental dedication. Now, uh, just to let you know what's coming up on Outside Source uh, in the next few minutes, we will be speaking to the pro-gun side of the debate over firearms in the United States. We'll also be looking at uh, this article by Anthony Zirkel, Zirka, just talking about how divided America is over the issue of gun control. Stay with us here on Outside Source. Hello, I'm Karen Ginoni. This is Outside Source. These are the main stories here in the BBC Newsroom. And every day, Outside Source features BBC journalists working in over 30 languages. Your questions are always welcome. BBC OS is the hashtag. Well, the United States is again forced to confront a mass school shooting. It's the 18th school shooting of the year. So far, there's been one every, in the US on average every 60 hours. But even as politicians across the board said today that mass shootings have to stop, it seems they are only getting worse. Here's what the president said a little earlier. Well, after each of these shootings, the gun debate takes over. Scarlett Lewis lost her six-year-old son, Jesse, in the Sandy Hook massacre. She says the education system needs to change to help emotional learning. Well, Scarlett Lewis stands at one end of the gun debate, but like many others, she's given up on actual gun control. At the other end stand those who oppose any gun control in the name of the Second Amendment to the US Constitution. AWR Hawkins is in that camp and joins us now. He's the Second Amendment columnist for Breitbart News. AWR Hawkins, a warm welcome. Well, that's the Second Amendment side of gun control, but like most things in America, as you heard there, a divided debate indeed. Uh, that is exactly the angle that Anthony Zerka has been looking at on the BBC website. He talks about two Americas speak in the aftermath. And Anthony, it doesn't sound like much changes, whatever happens. Now, more children than ever before are living in conflict areas at risk of death and violence. This is from a new report by the charity Save the Children. Countries like uh, Syria in the Middle East, Afghanistan in Central Asia and Somalia in Africa came out as the worst countries for young people in the report. The charity said at least 357 million children, that is one in six of every child on the planet, living in conflict zones. That's an increase of 75% since the early 1990s. And according to a record of incidents verified by the UN, there has been a 300% increase in the number of children killed and maimed since 2010. Now, Caroline Anning is Senior Conflict and Humanitarian Policy Advisor and co-author of the War on Children report. What my, my colleagues and myself wanted to do, you know, we work day to day in Syria, in Yemen, in South Sudan, and we're seeing up close what's happening to children there, was to take a step back and look at kind of 20 years of history and see are things getting better or worse. It often feels like they're getting worse, but are they really? And unfortunately, what we found was it looks like they are. So that one in six children, more than 350 million living in conflict, that's gone up significantly over the last 20 years. And what we also found was that the threats that those children are facing, whether it's the rate of them being killed and maimed, being recruited into armed groups, is also going up, particularly in the last five years. And what is behind these huge increases? It's simply a matter of there being more war. Partly that's the case. Yes, wars are going on for longer. They're becoming more protracted, more complicated. You only have to look at something like the war in Syria where there's dozens of armed groups fighting in just one area. And we also see things like an increasing use of explosive weapons in populated areas. So in the areas where children are living, in towns and cities, there's heavy weaponry dropping there, dropping on playgrounds, dropping on schools. And people are not being held to account for that. They're not being held to account for the behavior for the destruction that they're wreaking on children's lives. I suppose aside from the physical threat of war, the things that uh, war does to the present of the children is one thing, but the future of these children is completely disrupted. They don't even have education in some cases. Well, I mean, that's the real worry. You know, I was just in Yemen uh, late last year and I've met children there whose lives are, are physically destroyed by the conflict. You know, children whose spines have been blown out by blast injuries, children who've been blinded, deafened by the conflict but also children who haven't been able to go to school for two or three years, children who've seen their parents killed and are traumatized and then don't have access to some of the services and support they need to help them recover. And we and other agencies are there to try, and, to try and help them recover and most of my colleagues on the ground in Yemen are, are all Yemenis doing what they can to help fix their society. But really, you know, this is a global problem that we have to tackle together because otherwise, if this is allowed to fester, then you'll see a cycle of violence where children who've been traumatized are then perpetuating conflict. 
Is there anything in the report that gives you cause for optimism? Anything encouraging at all? Well, I think the fact that, in a way, even though it might sound counterintuitive, that we know that things have got worse shows that they were better not that long ago, and we can get back to that point. And we do see, you know, we know as Save the Children, there's examples in this report of the children that we're working with, the work that we've done, that with the right support, children are incredibly resilient. Like, they can recover. The things that they can recover from are actually amazing, and the way they can recover with just basic support, you know, having enough food to eat, being able to go to school. That's all children really need. So, you know, that absolutely gives me cause for optimism. Caroline Anning. Now, we heard earlier that South Africa's got a new president. Well, Ethiopia has lost its prime minister over the last few hours. Haile Mariam de Salen has resigned unexpectedly. Here's his announcement on state TV. Now, against the backdrop of that shocking attack on students in Parkland, Florida, we're going to take a look at another community that has long dealt with crippling levels of violence. Compton in California is synonymous with gang violence. It's an area of Los Angeles County, but in Compton, homicide and gun crime have been falling in recent years. The BBC's Cathy Kay has this report. It contains flashing images from the start. To Australia now, where the Prime Minister has banned ministers married or single from having sex with their staff. Malcolm Turnbull announced an overhaul to ministerial standards earlier. Here's what he said. Now, the crackdown comes after a scandal involving his deputy, this man, Barnaby Joyce. Now, he's under growing pressure to resign after admitting to having an affair with his former staffer. Now, she's pregnant with his child. He's split with his wife of 24 years and is in a relationship with his former employee. Let's just show you this tweet. A cartoonist compares it to a far more famous sex scandal. One thing for sure, he says, Barnaby Joyce cannot adopt the Bill Clinton defence that he did not have sexual relations with that woman. Well, this is how uh, the depiction is of a cartoonist. Let's try and do that again so you can see it. There we go. Uh, a pregnant woman and a politician facing the boot. Well, BuzzFeed is calling uh, the new prime, the prime minister's new rule, the Barnaby Bonk ban, and that hashtag as well as Barnaby Gate is trending. Uh, plain talking Australian headlines there. Uh, check out this, the front page of the Age today. That headline, Malcolm Turnbull's first commandment. Let's get more now from Hal Griffith in Sydney. Outside Source is back uh, Monday next week. I'm Karen Ginoni here in London. Thanks for watching.